All right. Thanks, everyone, for coming today. Um, my name is uh, Brian Ledet. I'm an assistant professor at SUNY ESF, also a board member at Central New York Lyme uh, Tick-Borne Disease Alliance. I've been researching ticks for about 14 years now, um, so I know a couple things about them, and I'd like to share some of that knowledge with you today. Um, just so you know, this is tailored to, um, to talk a little bit more about cattle and, and what's relative to cattle, because everybody on the call should have an interest in, in cows um, for a specific reason, I think. Um, so ticks, when, what you need to know. I also talk about protecting yourself and your family because not all of us have cows. Um, so most people don't know is that the first disease ever shown to be transmitted by an insect or a bug was actually a tick-borne disease. It wasn't a mosquito-borne disease like malaria, but it, were it was uh, Texas cattle ranchers that, that approached the United States government and said, look, we got a problem. These northern cows we're bringing down are sick when they get down to our fields. And what it was, it was a tick-borne disease spread by uh, the cattle tick. Um, and uh, it was a protozoan that affected the northern cows because they weren't uh, immune to it like the southern cows were. And the, the gentleman that actually discovered this was uh, Theopold Smith here. He was a Cornell grad and, and, and a grad from the Albany College of Medicine. So it's this local tie to the area and just a, a really cool story. Uh, a couple years later, mosquitoes were, were shown to be the, 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 the disease carrying vector for malaria, but the ticks beat them out. So there's a, there's a lot of different ticks in the United States. There's about 80 species. Here are uh, some five of the more common ones that, that you may find. Um, we have less in that that you'll find in upstate New York. Um, but this slide is to show you that the ticks look very different. And some of them may not look as different to you as they do to me, um, especially the, the, the lower uh, life stages here. And actually, um, I can't do my, my, uh, let me do a spot right here. Ah, there we go. Um, so these are the baby life stages here. And they look very similar. They're very small. Um, between each of these life stages, the tick must take a blood meal. It only takes a b one blood meal between life stage. So blood meal here, blood meal here, and then blood meal up here. These are the nymphal ticks, kind of like the tweens. Um, then you have the adult ticks, male or female. And then usually it's the female adult t a tick that feeds. Um, and you can see the different stages of feeding here. So early feeding onto late stage feeding. I usually give my presentation on multiple screens, but I'm in the field today and I'm in Northern uh, Pennsylvania working off my laptop, so. All right, so one of the, uh, well, some of the more common ticks you may have heard about and ones that may plague us here in the future, but definitely in New York State. Um, here you have the Lone Star Tick. Uh, the Lone Star Tick is, is a tick that's known and uh, termed for the star on the, on the female's back. It's a, it's a solid, white dot, looks like the lone star of the Texas flag. This tick was really endemic or, or you know, really historically lived in the southern United States, um, but that's made its way, its way up north, and, and you can find this tick very present in downstate New York, especially on Long Island. The next tick we're gonna see here is the American dog tick. The American dog tick is a tick we have in some central New York. Um, again, the, the smaller stages look very similar to the naked eye, but the larger stage, stages look, look different with their ornamentation or their, or their designs on their back. Next, we have a tick that most of us are probably very familiar with. with. If you get a tick on yourself in and around central New York, this is likely the tick that, 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 that you have pulled off. Um, the second most common would be the last tick I just showed you, the, the, the American dog tick. This is the black-legged tick, also known as the deer tick. Um, right now, the nymphal stages are active. They're about the size of a poppy seed. The adults were active earlier on in the year. They're trailing down now. And I'm actually finding right now the, the larvae are, are active a little earlier this year, uh, likely to, due to the mild winter we, we kind of had. And we didn't have that March, you know, cold or snow event. The next tick I like to talk about, especially when I think about farms or people that own large properties um, is the brown dog tick. The brown dog tick is a, is, is a tick that's found globally. Um, this tick is high, highly infest dogs. Um, it lives in porches. It can actually lead to infestations of the house. Um, so when people come to me and say, look, I've got ticks crawling on my walls, I go, well, you probably have dogs, and that is the brown dog tick. Um, lastly, I want to talk a little bit about the Asian longhorn tick, and this tick is is recently invaded the United States. You may have heard about it in the news. 
Um, it's been found, I think, 17 or 18 counties across the United States. We have not seen it in Syracuse or Onondaga yet, but it has definitely been found in, in some states and in, in some counties in New York, especially in the Hudson Valley. Um, this tick came from Asia, uh, likely on, on cattle or something. I don't, I'm not really sure. I don't think they really know how it came here. Um, the thing about this tick is it doesn't really like to bite humans or mice. It really likes to feed on sheep, goats, cows, um, those types of animals. And there are reports from in New York, uh, uh, North Carolina, where this tick actually exhibits swarming behavior, meaning you'll have thousands, tens of thousands of these ticks attaching to a host, and it can really quickly drain that host of blood and can cause loss to livestock. Once you have an infestation of the tick, this tick, it's very hard to combat uh, because this tick doesn't need to mate. Um, actually, there's only been one male found in the, in the United States. The female tick, all she needs to do is take a blood meal and then she'll lay her thousand eggs. So it should be a growing concern to, to, to people that, that own cattle or, or, or livestock. All right, so why do we talk about ticks so much now? I always hear that 10, 15 years ago, you know, we didn't have a tick problem in upstate New York. Well, humans, humans messed that up. We, we had a really good control of ticks. Um, in the early 1900s, you can see on the left here, we almost killed every deer in the United States. And that was a good thing for ticks. Wasn't a, bad, wasn't a good thing for the environment. Well, it was a partial good thing for the environment. Um, we decided through conservation, we were going to bring back the white-tailed deer and the other deer, which provide a suitable host for the adult ticks. The same thing that was happening in that time is that colonists were coming in and settling the United States and deforesting the total United States. So this is the graph on the right, and you can see the green are forested areas. You can see by the early 1900s, there were only certain areas with continuous forest. Um, we decided that wasn't a good thing either and brought back forest because we realized how important green space was. So the bring the deer back, bring the forest back, really put us in a perfect storm for the increase in ticks and tick-borne diseases. When we brought back forests, we didn't bring back these types of forests, virgin forests, large continuous forests that, subverse, that, that have a, a very good biodiversity of animal life and almost this equilibrium of, of how nature should be. We brought back this type of forest, this fragmented forest. This fragmented forest doesn't support certain animal species that are important in the food web, especially to help kill deer. It supports smaller, what we call habitat generalists, like mice, um, and they can support them in very large numbers. This type of forest also adds extra area for us, for humans to come in contact. So you have these edge areas um, that increase with this fragmented, fragmenting of the environment. So we, not only did, did humans do that, but we also, we also are, are um, partially responsible for this, um, and, and not this, uh, this is a growing chart of the of regions in the United States. So, if you live in a, in if you live in central New York, you know that you can plant um, species of, of zones five and six, um, but you can't plant species of zone eight or zone nine. That's why we don't have, you know, uh, coconut trees, banana trees, and orange trees in central New York. Uh, the environment is not there for these plants to get through their life cycle, their developmental life cycle. And the same thing is pretty uh, similar for ticks. Ticks are limited by their developmental life cycle. They're very long lived. So ticks can live up to two years in the environment. And most of that time is spent off of the animal, off of the mouse, off of the deer. Basically 95% of their life is spent on the ground, kind of like a plant. Well, plant has 100% of their life, but it's very close. Therefore, they're really impacted by the weather. They're impacted by climate. And until recently, because of global, global climate change, there were areas that were not suitable for this tick to make it from the little stage all the way to the female stage and laying eggs. Now that's changed, um, and that's coincided with the, the white-tailed deer coming back and the fragmentation. And that's why we're seeing this, this tick move across the landscape and new areas and new people affected by their diseases. And researchers in Canada have, have actually measured this, this, um, this movement. It's about 28 miles a year in Ontario. So how do ticks find their host? Um, they need these blood meals to survive. And ticks basically have two strategies, ambush or hunter. And here you have a tick uh, employing ambush strategy to find a host. They'll basically sit on a leaf or a twig and they'll put their front arms in, in the sky um, looking for a host. And once a host comes by, they have claws, they'll grab on, 
climb up and find a nice place to, to have a blood meal. The other type of, of, of strategy is a hunter strategy. And here you have a lone star tick, again, that tick with that dot on its back. And these types of ticks don't really climb up and wait, they chase you down. Um, so this tick can run for about three meters trying to take chase down a host. Um, and then once they get onto your shoes or the, you know, your socks or your feet, they'll climb up and find a good place to feed. So what are they looking for? Well, they're looking for a host and they're not just looking for any host. They have some typical cues they, they, they're looking for or sensing. One of those are different odorants or CO2 from your breath. Um, certain animal breath can be attractive to certain ticks. There's also um, chemicals like ammonia or butyric or lactic acid, things we, we release when we sweat. Um, so that's attractive. I have a roadkill deer here. Um, there is a tick species that is actually attracted to roadkill deer, dead deer. And not to feed on the deer because, well, the deer is, the deer is dead, but to wait for scavengers to come by like coyotes. And once a coyote comes by, they'll climb up the coyote and start feeding. Ticks also have a cue that can sense radiant heat. So when the tick is out there looking with, it, with its front, front legs, it may see something like this. It sees a warm blooded, a blooded animal on the backdrop of, of a cold forest. And that's a cue for the tick to actually know that there's a warm uh, blooded host nearby. They can sense vibrations. Um, I, this is an elephant. There's not many elephants um, hanging out in the forest that I'm working in right now, but I, I couldn't find a good deer vibration picture. However, that not being said, elephants are still affected by ticks. Most, most animals are. This is the elephant tick. Um, it's a kind of interesting looking tick with a bunch of dots. Um, so so tick, some ticks can feel, vibration, feel the vibration. Um, and then um, some ticks actually respond to sound. They can hear. Um, they can hear things like a, a cow chewing, the oscillation of its, of, of its jaws, or the sound of a dog barking, and they'll actually search down where that is coming from. And then lastly, ticks emit these pheromones, kind of like tick perfume or cologne, um, and it kind of tells the tick, other ticks around them what, what, what's, what's going on and what we're doing. And here you see a bunch of larval ticks aggregating. So one tick that said, hey, I'm here, let's all hang together and wait for the next host to come by. So ticks are looking for you. Where are they looking for you? Where do they live? Well, we, we like to think, um, and uh, the, these are probably really great tick habitats, and a lot, of, a lot of the things you hear about ticks are related specifically to the black-legged tick, and these are really good black-legged tick or deer tick habitats. They like these deciduous broadleaf forests that produce this understory of of leaves that are decaying, that are warm, that are moist. Because the black-legged tick is not a very robust tick. They are prone to drying out. Um, they're pretty weak, actually, um, when compared to other ticks. So this is the kind of place these ticks like. Not to say you can't find them other places, but these are the areas you'll find them the most. However, you know, places we work or places we live, if you own a lot of land or you work on a farm, this is very common to see a meadow, a meadow bordering a forest. Now you'll find the black-legged ticks here in the forest, but you can find ticks in the meadow area, especially the American dog tick. They're more likely to be found on the edge grass area. Um, and, you know, it's just to know that you're not safe everywhere. If you're in a parking lot in downtown Syracuse, you're probably safe from, from ticks. But, but you're not safe in, in these types of environments. So um, just know that every tick species is different and there's 80 of them in the United States. But where do we most likely encounter ticks and the ticks that, what ticks are we most likely to encounter? And I said, there are a few ticks in upstate New York we're most likely to encounter and one of them is the black-legged tick. And the majority of the rest of my presentation will kind of talk directly about the black-legged tick because that does spread and is the biggest health threat to people in central New York. So the places we encounter ticks are, one, where the ticks are, so these types of forests, but also where we are in the forest. So if you're walking in this forest, you're probably not trudging through this, this underbrush here. Um, you're probably walking on this trail. So you're more likely to encounter the ticks on the edge of the trail. Now, if you go into the brush, to go see a bird or, or you, you heard an animal move, yes, there are ticks there, but the majority of people are sticking to trail. So the edge of the trail is a risky area. However, it's not as risky as your yard because you spend way more time in your yard than you do on trails. Um, therefore, about 70% of New York residents actually experience a tick bite on the edge of their yard. 
So it's this edge, this what I what we call ecotones, a change in environment. So the ch the change from your lawn to the forest that you are more likely to spend most of your time, and that's going to have tick habitat. Um, not to say you can't you won't go in the forest and get ticks, but you're not in there as much as you are in your yard. So that's where you need to be aware and be careful. So what about tick survival? I get the question all the time. You know, is this winter? Is that winter? How's it going to be? Can you predict it? If I could predict it, I'd you know win the lottery here. But um, but it's really hard to predict tick activity. Um, in ideal conditions, ticks can live up to two years, uh, depending on, on how active they are. I tell people they're not like mosquitoes. Mosquitoes can take a blood meal, rest for seven days, go get another blood meal rest for seven days, feed on some, some nectar, um, get some energy that way. Ticks have to, have to take a blood meal. They can't get any other energy. They're like your lawnmower. If it runs out of gas, it's dead. Um, you can fill your lawnmower back up. Ticks can only be filled up three times, and then they're dead. Um, so it's like a, a, it's like a really expensive lawnmower that you can only use three times, and then it dies. So it only has a certain finite amount of energy, and the, amount of the, the activity time of that tick decreases that gas or that energy. In the winter, what do ticks do? Well, they live in tick igloos. Um, these areas underneath the snowpack, underneath that layer of thin ice above the leaf litter that is decaying, that is moist, that is you know hot, it was, it's warm because of the active process of decay. These are very different climates than we experience as humans above the snowpack. So these people don't have to worry about ticks, but there's probably ticks active underneath, not active, but dormant underneath that snowpack waiting for the snow to subside. And as soon as you can see ground, you have the opportunity for ticks to actually start climbing up from that um, leaf litter and, and to find a host. So just because it's winter uh, doesn't mean that ticks can't be active. Ticks feed on a different, a wide variety of hosts. And I put some of the more common hosts, especially for the black-legged tick in, in this diagram or this picture here, this, this uh, collage. Deer are important. You, you probably hear about deer being being the respon being responsible for Lyme disease. I, I like to clarify that deer do not carry Lyme disease. They they don't get infected with Lyme disease. They're essential for the the adult leg the adult tick to feed on. The adult tick will not feed on small rodents, things like chipmunks, mice, birds, shrews, or voles. They need medium to large sized mammals to feed on. So things like deer and foxes or coyotes or raccoons. So all good hosts for the adult black-legged tick. Without the adult tick, you don't have the baby ticks, and then you, you basically can stop that cycle. Um, here you have a song sparrow. We actually caught in, a, in Onondaga County. You can see there's about 36 ticks about. There is exactly 36 ticks on this song sparrow. Here's a really good nymph on its eye feeding or around its eye. Um, chipmunks and mice are, 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 are highly competent um, hosts for these ticks. And then shrews and voles as well um, can, can be hosts for these ticks. And these guys you don't, you don't see very often. All right, so what about the tick? Let's talk a little bit about the tick. Um, so the ticks, again, they start as eggs. Um, this is a female tick laying eggs. Depending on the species of tick, um, they can lay between 1,000 to 10,000 eggs. Uh, the black-legged tick lays about two to 3,000 eggs. Um, so that's why that deer is important. If that deer has 50, adult uh, female ticks on it, then there's, you know, 150,000 eggs that can be laid. Um, the eggs hatch into larvae. Um, the larvae are very small. Here's a size on a penny. So they're about the size of the O and God on the penny. Um, it's important to note that they're not, they're not infected with Lyme disease. If they were, we would have even more of a problem with Lyme than we do already. Um, they can transmit some diseases, but those diseases are really, really well not understood very well. So we're trying to do some of that research in the lab. Um, after the, the larval blood meal, the tick will, will molt into a nymph. Um, this is a nymphal tick up here um, compared to an adult tick. Um, this nymphal tick is the first stage that can spread disease or transmit um, the pathogen that causes disease. And this, is, this tick is the most likely tick implicated in disease transmission of Lyme disease. It is because it's very hard to see. It's the size of a poppy seed. The adult tick is much easier to see and you're more likely to notice it, take it off before the pathogen has been transmitted. Just as an example, um, to give you a really good example of, of how small these ticks are, this was a, a poppy seed muffin that was released by the CDC, and they told people to spot the five ticks. Um, the five ticks are actually right here, and we'll zoom in. 
And you can see a really good tick right here. This is one of the ticks. Again, they're the size of a poppy seed. So they're very, very small. And imagine trying to find one of these on your body. Once the nymph takes a blood meal, then, then they then molt into adults. Uh, the adult tick it can still be infected with Lyme disease. It can, can, can still transmit Lyme disease. So you're not out of the clear. Um, it's just the adult tick is much bigger um, and it's much easier for us to see. Um, the adult female takes a blood meal um, over several days, engorges on, on blood, and then lays eggs, and the cycle starts over again. So why talk about ticks? If ticks didn't cause disease, we probably wouldn't care, but they do. Um, so I've, I've put together a map here of the Lyme disease cases in each region, and again, we'll probably focus more on region number four here, so central New York. Um, and these are the, this is the rate, so this is the number of cases per 100,000 people um, from 1994 to about 2018, where we have the most recent data. And you can compare areas like central New York, areas like western New York, to areas of downstate New York, where disease was, was very high a long time ago and is actually either correcting, plateauing, getting better. Um, if, you, if, you, if you make this a percentage, you can see that downstate New York is, is seeing a decrease in rates of Lyme disease. Whereas we are seeing an explosion. I mean, you're talking about the Finger Lakes at a 970% increase. Central New York's a 439% increase. And that's because the ticks move in this way. Um, we're seeing more and more of these ticks and they're carrying more and more disease. Downstate New York, they still have the tick. Um, there is another tick um, that the, the Lone Star tick is coming in and becoming more prevalent. Um, but also the attitude on tick and tick-borne diseases, it, can, it may be different down there. Um, whereas they're more likely to think about ticks and tick-borne diseases because they've been dealing with it for decades. And it's fairly new to us in central New York. Okay, so what happens if, uh, when you get sick, if you get bit and, the disease is and you get a disease? Most tick-borne diseases start as a general illness, so a fever, uh, weakness, muscle pain, um, headache, maybe some confusion, chills. Some tick-borne diseases can cause nausea and vomiting. So just you, you feel, you don't feel good. You almost feel like you have the flu, um, but it's not flu season. Um, you could have COVID-19. Hopefully we're all social distancing and wearing masks. I, I see some people in the audience are, are, are wearing masks. Um, I'm social distance in, in the middle of nowhere. Um, so, um, you know, these are, these are things that can confuse doctors. Um, so therefore it's really important for you to stress that you may have been bitten by a tick or if you have a tick to present that tick to your doctor. The most common disease in, in upstate New York is, is Lyme disease and Lyme disease presents in a few different ways. This is the most common tick-borne disease in all of North America. Um, early stage of the disease, you always hear about this bullseye rash, um, and the, the actual name of the rash is erythema migrans. And that name actually literally translates to an expanding red rash. It doesn't mean bullseye. It doesn't mean you need to have the, this clearing. It means you need to have a red rash that gets bigger. Um, this rash typically develops um, about seven days after, after tick bite, but it doesn't occur in everybody. And not everybody notices it, depending on where you're bit. If this rash occurs on the, ba on the back of your head and you have a full head of hair, you're not gonna see that. Um, if it occurs on your shoulder blade and you're, and you're not one look at your back, you're not going to see that either. Um, a lot of people just think, well, it wasn't a bullseye rash, so it could be Lyme disease. I say, look, is it expanding? Well, I don't know. Okay. You get bit by a tick and you, you notice a red rash. I tell people to take a Sharpie and trace the margins of that rash. If you wake up the next day and your rash is bigger than your Sharpie, you've got an erythema migraine and you need to go to your doctor. You should be treated with doxycycline, especially in central New York. If you don't notice it if, it, if it, if it goes untreated, you can develop more severe disease. In the United States, the most common disseminated uh, manifestation of Lyme disease is arthritis, but it's not the only one. Um, this arthritis is usually major joints, so your knee, your hip, um, elbow, shoulder. Um, however, the, the bacteria itself can actually get into the heart tissue and cause really severe cardiac abnormalities known as uh, known as heart, third degree heart block, and this can be fatal. It can also get into the brain and the, the linings of the brain and cause problems there. Um, this woman has a transient or a temporary facial paralysis. It looks like a stroke, but it, it will go away. Um, and then you can have swelling of the linings of the brain and, or, or meningitis, and, and those can lead to, to lifelong complications. So it's important to get to recognize, get treated, and early, or even better, don't get bit. I'll, I'll talk about, here's my teaser there. How, how do you not get bit? Well, you, it's easy. Um, 
I do it all the time. Uh, I've, I've been out there uh, humping around, humping around for like three days, um, collect, actively collecting ticks, and I haven't got bit yet. Um, but I don't expect you to do what I do. Um, so I'm going give to you, give you some tips um, that I do when I'm out in the yard working. Um, I wear light long sleeves and pants. Um, I wear light colored clothes because I can see the ticks climbing up. They are dark. So against uh, khaki pants or, or like a Columbia shirt that's lighter than this, I can see that little black, black speck and I can take it off before it gets onto my skin. I tuck my pants into, into my socks and shirt into my pants and I'll tell you why. Um, you know, this is a, a, a picture I pulled off the internet of a student collecting ticks. This is not how we collect ticks. This is how we collect ticks. It's very hot in this. Um, it's denim. Um, it's very hot today. Um, and uh, it's not very fun, but we don't get bit um, because the only way a tick can get into this is through our neck. Um, we, everything else is taped up or zipped up or sewed in. Um, so uh, it's got to climb a long ways to, to, to get to us. Because remember, ticks attached to your lower extremities. So what can you do? If you tuck your pants into your socks, that tick has to climb all the way up your leg. Hopefully your, your shirt's tucked in and then it has to climb all the way up your shirt to get down to your neck or get to your head. Hope, and hopefully you'll notice it by then and, and you, can, you can just uh, wipe it away and you don't have to worry about it, it attaching to your skin. In addition to this, you can use personal bug sprays. Um, things like permethrin, it's used only on clothing or your gear. Um, so I, I love using these on, this on my, my work boots or my, uh, my outdoor, like my, my lawn mowing shoes. Um, this you can spray on your shoes, you let it dry and you're good to go. Um, it can even get wet a couple times. Um, one thing you have to note is follow the application instructions because right out of the bottle, it will kill cats. It's not, it's not very safe for cats. Once it binds to, to, to the fabric in your clothes or on your, your boots or on your gear, it can get wet again and, it, and it's not toxic to cats. Um, if you want to use something for your skin, we recommend uh, a DEET or picaridin based sprays, at least 20%. Um, I go higher with my DEET. Um, just because I, I hate mosquitoes. Um, you, we have a website on, we have a, a link to an EPA website on our, on uh, cnyalliance.org that you can go to and you can find the right repellent for you. Um, there are some more natural alternatives on there, but it's important to, that they're all EPA proven effective. Um, and you don't want to go for these products that, that are not proven effective and may give you this false sense of security. And then even if you do all that, you still need to do ticks and showers. I do. I mean, I was out there for six hours this morning and I came in wearing all that gear and I still pulled all my clothes off, looked for where ticks would be, um, you know, everywhere. But, but some of the more common areas are your waist area behind your knees, your shoulder blades, behind your ears and your hair. Um, and then take a shower. I mean, if you take, if you take a shower, all the, any tick that's not attached to you will, can wash off. Also taking a shower, you have time to look at yourself and see, oh, is that, that's not a freckle that I notice. And then you can throw your, your clothes in a hot dryer for about 15 to 20 minutes. I told you earlier, ticks hate being dry, hate the heat. This will kill any ticks on your clothing, um, and you don't have to worry about those uh, attaching to you later on. So what can you do on your property? And I gear this to people that have large properties or maybe even manage your own farm. Um, you should be monitoring your animals for infestations as you do with normal animal health. Um, mainly because there are some ticks out there that can get out of control really quickly, especially some of that, that invasive tick. And you're going to want to know if you have a problem and trying to, trying to get, get ahead of that before, before you, you lose livestock. Um, you can treat dogs and cats with products that kill ticks and fleas as recommended by your veterinarian. Um, I know in, in properties, large properties, dogs are very common, and then cats are used to control rodents um, in, in, in the farm setting. Um, you just don't want them being host for ticks as well. Deer exclusion as best possible. Deer are a really important host, um, and you, if you can exclude them from as much of the property as possible, then you will have an impact on the tick population. And then having a rodent control plan, limiting access to food sources like um, seed or, or, or other sources in barns. I, I know it's hard, but it but it will help reduce tick and tick-borne diseases, and then having a, an active pest management program. But what can you do around your house? Um, so if, you, if you're, you're at home, um, we tell people you can create what we call no-go zones. These are activities where you have the highest tick potential. So in this picture, it's the forest, and the edge of the forest. Um, you keep your kids, you keep yourself away from those areas. Um, this image has a, a three-foot wood chip uh, 
um, path or a rock path. And that can help visually separate the no-go zones. It also adds an environment that's not conducive to ticks. Rocks, wood chips, very dry. So it hopefully it will keep the ticks in the forest. Um, wood piles, a lot of us have wood here in upstate New York. So keep those away from your house. These are great places for rodents. Um, keep them on the wood chip path or next to these no-go zones. And it's just an area where, where you're really highly aware when you're out there. If you have grandkids or kids, keep the place set away from the no-go zones. Keep it close to your house um, so they have less contact with the ticks. Um, removing leaf litter because that's where ticks like to hang out. Creating open sunny areas by pruning trees, letting that sunlight in will help make environments not conducive to, to the lifestyle of this tick. Keeping your lawn mowed nice and short so that so the sunlight can penetrate. Tripping any shrubs or walkways near your patio will keep these, these areas illuminated and, and, and hopefully dry these ticks out that may drop off there from, from rodents. Um, surrounding gardens with stone and gravel, making these sunny lawn paths. And then again, keeping deer out. Um, and if you, you if you have if you can afford the, the fencing, we recommend at least seven and a half feet high. Um, deer only jump about eight feet high, but seven and a half seems to, seems to offer maximum protection with with a better eyesight than an eight foot wall. Um, if if you're landscaping, like a lot of people are doing now, because um, because of the staying at home orders, um, selecting deer resistant plants for your landscape are, are are important, and we have some of those linked on our website. And then removing any um, invasive species like uh, Japanese barberry, which it makes good habitat for ticks, or honeysuckles, things that ticks like to uh, ticks that deer like to browse. You need to remove these types of things because attracting these animals is just going to bring ticks closer to you. All right, let's just say you do find a tick. You did all this and you still find a tick. What do you do? Well, I don't use any of this fancy get gizmos. Um, I've removed tens of thousands of ticks, not from myself, but from different types of animals. I use a, a fine pair of tweezers. I grasp the tick as close to the skin as possible and pull straight out. That tick will come out. If it's mouth part staying, don't worry about it. Your immune system will kick it out. It'll be fine. You can put some antibiotic cream on there or some, or some alcohol. Um, to, to help with the healing process. Um, keep that tick, don't throw it away. Um, I have a colleague um, who is also a board member at the Alliance at Upstate University, you might have heard, they do free tick testing. So you can put it in a Ziploc bag, throw it in your freezer, and you can mail it to the thangamanilab.com. You'll get an individual number, and you can find out what disease pathogens were in that tick that bit you. Um, now, don't wait for that test turnaround. If you get sick, you need to go to your doctor. So monitor yourself for tick-borne disease symptoms. If you get sick, go see your doc. Say, hey, I pulled a tick off it. I sent it to the Thangamani lab. They're in the process of IDing stuff. But what do you think? Um, and then ultimately, you know, we are serving as a local resource for you to give you um, information that's been vetted by scientists um, and just to keep you, yourself, and your family safe and prepared to, to spend time outdoors.